Okay, so unfortunately I have to take another long trip and I know I told you guys in the last video that I'm gonna be using the Denali. Anytime I take a long trip, I'm gonna document everything. But unfortunately, I'm not gonna make a video on this one, it's, it's stupid. But I have some computer issues going on with that truck so I can't take it. So it kind of leads me to what vehicle should I take? So I'm headed to Ryan's Diesel Service Kodiak truck there in the same building. I'm gonna continue to build the shorty that I promised you guys, so that's what I'm gonna be doing. So I'm gonna need to be out there for a couple days to put all that together. But we do have the Cummins, which I can't drive, of course. It's not even registered, not ready to go, and it's kind of a long drive. This is more of a hot rod truck. I don't want to take it on a long trip. The Wife Max is my other option, but it's sort of mocked up right now after some of the body work that I did with it, so I can't take that on a long trip. And like I talked about, Denali, no way. Power Stroke's not even registered, I can't drive it. Which leads me to the old trusty LBZ Duramax 07. Just to get you guys up to speed if you don't know, I'm sure you do, you know, those videos, wow. Unbelievable how many views those videos got when I was stranded in Colorado with the Duramax, with the Denali, the new truck. But yeah, I'm a little freaked out, not gonna lie. Just to get you guys up to speed, the DPF, the emission system, actually plugged up completely with black soot and it left me stranded in the mountains. I was driving from Michigan all the way to Nevada and then on the way back through to Michigan after I delivered the giveaway truck, I was completely stranded. My brother and I were together and we were sleeping on a park bench for two days. So that's kind of the wrap up and then you know I took it to Ryan's Diesel Service and he got me squared away back on the road. There's some other little electrical gremlins that I gotta work out. It's just stupid, man. New truck and you got all these dumb little problems with it. Now one little issue that I'm really concerned about, well first off, I have to do an oil change on the truck. It's been about a year since I've done an oil change, so I'm gonna do that. But what I'm trying to say is I'm gonna be doing some preventive maintenance checks and services on this truck. I'm gonna be removing the drive shaft. I gotta tighten that pinion nut. And the biggest reason why, and I don't wanna freak you guys out, but it was about three years ago, I was going down the highway. I was about an hour and a half from home and the pinion nut that holds the yoke on the rear end actually worked its way out and I lost my drive shaft on the highway. The pinion actually kicked up into the hub carrier assembly and the rear end locked. As I was going down the highway doing about 70 miles an hour, it was terrifying. As a matter of fact, let me clip into that right now. This is not good. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go ahead and pull my drive shaft out of my transfer case and I'm gonna try to limp it off the highway. I'm glad you're okay. Rear end's pretty locked up, isn't it? As you guys can see, that spindle is sitting straight up like that, so it's just kind of dinging around in there. That's why it's not turning in the back. That's why the back end's locked up. Well, the the, the nut that holds, oh. holds it to it, the spindle, it's still in there. That nut actually came loose. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. So. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty bad. That play right there, guys, is what he's talking about. It's shifting yeah, in and be, out. There shouldn't be any in and out movement on this at all. That's pretty bad. That's real ugly. <laughs> yeah, that pinion gave her a kiss, a good one. You can see all the way across here. Oh, missing right there. That's probably the initial hit where it locked in. Mm. Oh, we got some carnage. Look at right here. Nice big old ding. <laughs> Somehow, it looks like your posse still might have worked. There was a couple missing teeth, but nothing all too ugly. Bearings, ring and pinion, all of it. It's 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 had it. I mean, we got a good housing. The housing will be fine. Um, we'll clean everything up and we'll rebuild it. So as you guys saw in that clip, it was a pretty bad situation, but thank God everything worked out. As a matter of fact, I shipped out the rear end to Kodiak Truck in Wisconsin, and those guys were able to square me away. I did a full YouTube video on it. Sort of a long story. I don't want to go into it, but you guys get the gist. And that was yet another reason why I decided to go ahead and just get a newer truck. That way I don't have to worry about all that craziness. But you know, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go ahead and pull the Cummins out. I'm gonna go ahead and get the LBZ Duramax 
inside of the garage. We're gonna go ahead and get it on the hoist. I'm gonna shake everything down, make sure nothing's loose, and I'm also gonna be torquing the lug nuts to spec. More importantly, after driving this truck for so many years, I'm actually gonna be removing the drive shaft like I talked about, and we're gonna check that pinion nut as well to make sure that thing isn't loose because uh, that's gonna be one of my biggest things. But I don't have to worry about the DPF plugging up because the truck never came with one. So I'm gonna be documenting my trip all the way there. It's about a six to nine hour drive depending on traffic once I get through Chicago. But be rest assured that I'll be turning the camera on if anything happens, okay? So I'm not trying to cause drama or nothing like that. But it's such a big heads up to anybody who has a truck. Some of you guys that own these Duramaxes, I think this video is gonna be very helpful. I went to my brother-in-law's house and he lives out in the sticks, man. And we just blasted through trails with this thing, but we can't take this to Wisconsin with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this thing off the truck really quick. excited about this i'm going to be installing this in this video today something that i've been waiting years to do on my trail ready off-road bumper we're going to install a gigantic winch in there in this video 13,000 pound winch this thing's going to work great in there hopefully it fits though i'm doing the measurements i'm pretty sure it will though but before i get this in the garage let's unbox that and see what it looks like Just like anything guys i'll leave a link in the description it comes with two wireless controllers this is your nylon rope which extends out to about 50 feet i would say overall this would be a good budget winch because I won't be using it all the time. Living in the great state of Michigan, people are always getting stuck. When I'm driving down the road, it's cool to be able to help out a fellow driver, pull him out of the snow or pull him out of a ditch. Okay, one more guys. I got another accessory that I'm gonna be putting on this truck. So bear with me. We're gonna install a tonneau cover on it. I'm gonna show you what I got. I removed the old one. I've had it for a long time. I've always wanted a quad fold instead of a tri-fold tonneau cover. These are gonna save on fuel economy. And it also has a built-in LED light right inside of it. I'm actually gonna leave a link in the description as well. I told the company that I'm gonna be installing this and they hooked us up with a $150 off coupon code. Oh yeah, this thing's heavy. Check it out guys. I gotta put everything on, the clips and all that, but just for sheer mock-up purposes. Like I said, quad fold. And the biggest reason why I like this like the main reason is because you get most of your bed space because if it was a quad fold this right here went to fold all the way up would come out to about here so you're going to lose about three quarters of your bed but let me get this thing put on put the tailgate up and i'll show you what it all looks like and that's it guys i think that's an awesome upgrade for the truck So now that we have that done, I'm gonna go ahead and install this winch, see how this works out. Let's see if I can do this without dropping it on my face. Nice, worked. That was really easy to install. Let's see if it works. Wireless controller, which is cool. I have a wired one as well, which I'll put in the truck just in case I lose, you know, a wireless one, which I probably will. I gotta engage it first. Oh, that's so cool. Look at that. Isn't that neat? It's so cool, man. It's about time I get a winch. But the trail ready bumper, it matched perfectly with the bolt holes and everything. The only thing that I had to outsource was these Allen bolts right here, which luckily I had them in the shop in nuts as well for the backings. But basically what I did is I just ran the power wire all the way directly to the battery. Now when I operate this thing and I'm being serious about it, the truck will stay on because I'd imagine that that 12 volt system right there will eventually drain that battery if I'm using it for extended periods of time. So the truck will stay on as I'm using it. Big shout out to Open Road right there where I picked it up. And this is what it looks like on the inside. 
I like the red and black. It really matches everything. This is the stuff that I like to use. Amsoil 15W40. This is a full synthetic. This is 9.46 quarts, so I will end up having to add a half a quart just to kind of level things out. And I like to use the AC Delco filters. Sometimes I'll switch it up to a high capacity PPE oil filter. It adds an additional quart, less oil interval changes. It's pretty good. I'm actually out of stock on those ones right here, so this is what I have left in the shop. But you know, AC Delco, you can't go wrong. Now when I do my oil changes, I like to let the O-ring do its job. So I'll just tighten it with my hand. Don't use that wrench. You're gonna over tighten that thing and possibly blow the seal. So that should be good. I'm gonna go ahead and spray it down with some brake clean, clean everything up. So while that's draining, I wanted to show you guys a few things. First off, this frame right here, I know it looks a little pitted and such, but it was completely covered in rust. I took a wire wheel and even a mild sandblaster, and I did my best to try to get all the scaling off. And I did a full video on it a while ago, but basically I used chassis saver to seal the frame up. So again, I knocked all the scales out, brought it down to almost metal, bare metal. Then I used chassis saver, and then I used the tractor supply implement high gloss black paint rattle can. Went over this whole frame, and it looks really good. And also about a year and a half ago, I installed PPE manifolds, up pipes, and a down pipe. I do sell these on my website, the up pipes and manifolds. But my overall opinion with the high flow manifolds and up pipe and down pipe, it really helps out with your exhaust gas temps. It keeps it a lot lower as you're cruising, pulling up hills with a trailer, stuff like that. And to be honest with you, the finish on this still looks really good, man. It looked nice and clean and high gloss, but, and it doesn't really matter. It's just, you know, at the end of the day, it's just cast, but it really looks good. It actually still dresses up the engine bay quite a bit. This truck is sitting on a six inch pro comp lift and it's sitting on a set of discontinued Anthem instigator wheels, 22 by 14s. And these tires were just released about a year ago, but these are the recon grappler nittos. And these are on a set of 325 50 R22s. Now I did shake everything down. I moved these wheels left and right just to make sure everything is good, but I do have the PPE HD tie rods. Um, I installed a Kodiak truck remanufactured transfer case. This thing will never leak on me ever. Also what's cool about these transfer cases is there's actually a three bearing design in the main shaft, which allows less friction when you're cruising. I'm not saying you're gonna get better fuel economy, but I mean, let's be honest, if you're cruising and you're getting less friction, it will help with your economy a little bit. This right here is a transfer case brace. This connects from your transfer case back to your Allison transmission. It keeps it solid as one unit because a lot of times guys, when you're getting on it, the back of the housing of the transmission can possibly crack. And this is what this brace right here prevents. So it's always a good option. I'm also running a AirDog 165 GPH lift pump. This thing is actually pretty brand new. I just installed it. I actually did away with my fast. But no matter what, guys, fast, air dog, they're all great. I think it's important that you guys put a lift pump on your truck if you have, you know, an 01 to a 2016 Duramax. They're just so important. And if you guys want to pick one up, I sell these on the website as well. Okay, guys, so now on to the important thing, which would be the pinion nut right here. Let's see it right there. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be able to get my finger in it. I'm going to have to drop this drive shaft right here in order to get to it. Every time you pull this drive shaft off, just it's a peace of mind. Just get back there and just see if that nut spins on the back of that pinion. If it's loose at all, of course, I'm going to tighten it. But if it's good, I'm not going to tighten it because Kodiak truck actually set the backlash and I don't want to mess with this. The other thing you guys can check and do it every time is take this drive shaft and move it up and down left and right and make sure there's zero play in there. There shouldn't be any play whatsoever. So once we have that removed, just make sure that the splines and the shaft look good. It's not all chewed up inside there. So just inspect that, make sure it's good. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Basically just see if it's loose. <laughs> Cause mine walked off and that is not good guys. It can cause serious injury or even death, man, if this thing comes off. Cause you lock up on the highway, you're going sideways, if not flip, especially with a lifted truck. So another thing, it's always a good idea to check the end caps on the U-joints, make sure that they're freely spinning. They're not locked up. And when you remove it, you gotta make sure that these don't fall off. Cause if they do, then you gotta basically install a brand new U-joint because then you're gonna lose the little needle bearings inside the end caps. Installing one of these things right here, it's not fun. Next, we're gonna go ahead and check for brake pad wear. 
So move my stupid little wheel light and look right inside that window. You can see that brake pad making contact with the rotor, which is this right there. As you can tell, these brake pads are pretty new. There's a lot of meat on them, but rule of thumb on this is three millimeter. Once it gets below three millimeter, it's crucial that you replace these brake pads. Look at the inners and the outers. And on the outside, you're gonna see the pad making contact with the rotor right here, which is plenty. There's a lot of meat on that. I just replaced these brake pads so I shouldn't have any issues because who knows, you may have just replaced these and it actually has uneven wear and you have an inner pad that is basically down to bare metal while your outer pad is looking brand new. I've seen that multiple times. I haven't really even scratched the surface, but I'd love to make a full YouTube video on this because there's just a lot of information to pass on when you're inspecting your vehicle, especially for a long road trip like myself. So a normal oil change when you pull the oil filter, it's gonna be 10 quarts total. So just check that dipstick when it's not running, just let it sit for a while, and then just add until you get to that fill line. That's pretty much it. 15W40 is what I like to use. Some people like to use other stuff. Uh, AMS oil is not the end all. You can also use Shapers. AMS oil is actually really expensive, but you can get away with like Rotella full synthetic. Some people don't like that, but I've never had any issues with it. I removed the fuel filter itself. I did a full fuel filter delete. And there it is right there, only because it was seeping fuel. These things are so problematic. If you have a lift pump, you really don't need one. The only good thing about it, in my opinion, is if you do end up running out of diesel, if that does happen, you trying to send that fuel back to the CP3 is kind of difficult if you don't have one of these primer balls to prime that fuel up to the engine. I mean, you can do it if you cycle the key, you know, and eventually it'll get up to the engine. And also a really good thing, all that access for activities, because this whole area right here is a fuel filter. Once you remove that, you have plenty of access to do anything you need to do in there. I'll leave a link in the description in this video where you guys can check out the fuel filter delete video that I did on my other channel. This is basically just a little bypass hose. And basically what I did is I just connected it to the return and supply. And that's it, just clamp it off and you're good to go. Just pulled the dipstick, wiped it off, put it back in. We are on the money. You know, the truck isn't perfect, but she sounds so good. It runs amazing, and I hope we don't have any issues on the way to Wisconsin. But pray for me, guys. But this is really just a video to show you guys what I'm up to. Sort of updates on the LBZ O Red build, as well as making the trip down there, which I'm not gonna do in this video. But again, you guys can be rest assured that I will flip that camera on if anything happens. But I am kind of excited to take this ridiculous truck to Wisconsin and see how she performs.